All right. Uh, this week, I'm going to be talking about chapter 10, which is about function factories. So uh, I'll be talking about what a function factory is, um, the difference between the factory and the, the child, the manufactured functions, um, talking about manufactured function environments, which are weird, uh, talking about promises and forcing in factories. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about my package factory, which was made to uh, get over some of the problems that factories have. Um, and then I'm going to try to spend a fair amount of time talking about why to use factories because they're weird and they're not used that much. Hadley actually talks in, in the book about how they're a thing that's like, it's a neat idea in R, but they're fairly rare. And part of the idea of my package is they don't have to be. Um, and so the packages I'm going to be using in this, um, there's, we actually aren't going to see that much R lang. Um, it's under the hood in a lot of what we're doing, but we'll see a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to use some examples from ggplot2 and scales. And then my package factory, you can install it on CRAN, but I've done a ton of development on it this week. So uh, I recommend the GitHub version if you want to play with that. All right. So what the heck is a function factory? Um, function factories are factories that make functions. Um, and I guess to pause here, uh, a slide that I forgot to include, Hadley talks about that factory, function factories and functionals both come from the idea that in R, functions are first class objects. Um, and he doesn't, at least that I've found clearly define that, it's a like programming term that once I found the clear definition, it just made sense that um, in R functions are objects like any other object that they can be arguments to a function, they can be returned by a function. Um, a way that a, a coworker put it is that functions are both verbs and nouns in R. They are things that you can pass around. You can s actually, despite the uh, the common error, you can subset them if you do certain things with them. They 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 are objects. Um, so. A sample simple function factory is this function that uh, takes as an argument an exponent and returns a function that raises the argument of that manufactured function to the exponent that you give it. So for example, I've got a couple ones here where I make a square function and a cube function. Square is power to the with two as the argument. Cube is power with three as the argument. When we call square of eight, it squares it and gives you 64. Um, I was running out of room on the slide, but if you cube something, it will give you the cube. That function is now a manufactured function. And the reason this all works is the environment of the manufactured function is the uh, evaluation environment of the function factory when you call the menu when you call the function factory. So if we look at it, square one and square or in cube one have their own um, environments. And then if we use our lang to pry inside, we can see that, you know, like in the code, you can't tell what's going on. It's just got this X to the exponent, but inside of that environment, it captured the value of exponent, which is two for square and three for cube. Um, <laughs> and there's my great Dane came in to say hi. Um, I guess actually, before I go on, uh, does everyone get that? Like th that is a key part of function factories. And if anyone has any questions there, uh, it's a good place to stop <laughs> if you, if you aren't wrapping your head around it. I know we had a conversation earlier in the week in the channel about it. And I just want to make sure everyone is there. <laughs> I see that you unmuted, Esme. Do you have a question? Yeah, I was about to ask a question, but I think I, I, it's fine. I figured it out. <laughs> you, okay, don't feel embarrassed because it is weird and complicated. Environments are crazy. Uh, like Darren did a great job trying to get us there, but environments are weird and they're a big part of function factories. Um, and it's actually part of what my package is trying to make less confusing about function factories. but. Um, yeah, so 
like hidden in the environment that is in, that this function captured is those definitions and that is useful for how they work. Um, but a problem with that, a, a danger of that is, uh, so when I call here, I'm calling power one of my exponent, which is a promise to be two. And so this is just a promise that the exponent is gonna be my exponent. But if I change it before it's ever evaluated, uh, it's two cubed instead of two squared, like you might think it would be. In this exact example, like uh, Hadley has the same sort of example. It seems like, oh, not a big deal. But if, if you think about it, if you had created this function and then way, way, way later in your code, you actually have used the function, you might be surprised that, oh, it, it, because the value you put into it changed, the, the, what it did changed. Um, that is a weird thing about factories that you have to be careful about because of lazy evaluation. And the way to fix that is this force function. Um, all this is doing is it's saying, okay, you're passing an exponent. I'm going to make sure that that gets it evaluated. And I say here, and it's, it is true that technically the, you don't need the force function. You could just put exponent there, or you could put list exponent, or you could put print exponent, or you could put anything you want, as long as you make exponent get evaluated, and then it's locked. It is whatever value you passed in. So, um, oh, no, I don't show the examples, but. Can I just, can I yep. jump in? I yep. just want to re-articulate this, and you can tell me if I'm on base or not, because I was really struggling to wrap my head around this. <laughs> yes. So, so my exponent in the prior slide yep. is just in limbo, like could be anything in promise land. Yes. Um, so by forcing, we're explicitly saying, I want to make my exponent concretely this thing. Right. And I really should have shown this on this slide and I will fix that uh, after the call that if we call, like if we do the same thing with this function, when it calls the power one, my exponent to like my exponent actually becomes two. exponent actually becomes two because it gets evaluated. And then when you do this call, it doesn't matter because this environment no longer has a promise. It has the actual value two in the environment. So when you call okay. the square, it actually squares. It's it's two in the environment of that function. Does that make sense? Yeah, because that is that is the crazy thing that's super confusing about function factories for sure, which is why I wrote the package factory. Um, and we've been expanding it this week to do all kinds of cool new superpowers with it. But so I, I made a package um, to get around a lot of the confusing stuff about factories. It's still, it's not like it's not confusing, uh, the, but it's less confusing and hopefully it's a lot less confusing. So what you do is I've got this function build factory and you give it a function um, with, you know, your variables in it. So like X to the exponent and you tell it what things in that are variables that you want the factory to have. Um, I was trying to make it where you didn't have to tell it, but let's say I had said X to the EXP. EXP is actually a function. So it's hard to tell, did you want to actually pass that in as a variable or did you want to use the function? If I tell it, I want exponent to be a function or a, a variable, um, it works. And so we see, you know, I do that same example as before and it works, you know, it, it takes the two and it forces it and it does the thing, you know, it does its real thing. And if we look at the definition of this function, it actually doesn't just have exponent floating there and it doesn't even have its own environment. It is a normal function at this point when you use build factory. Um, and yeah, so I don't plan today to go through how the package works because it is really, it's much later in the book. <laughs> so chapter 19, um, we'll be ready. And hopefully once we read chapter 19, I will have to do a lot less trial and error when I'm fixing things in factory because right now it's like, Oh, I think, I think I want an expert or do I want an quo? I'm not sure. Um, so hopefully we can get there. Um, I have another question. The chapter, and I, if I'm getting ahead of myself, you could tell me to shut up. But 
the chapter talks about um, garbage collection within a factory. Do you have like where you can explicitly call the exponent? Can you also say these are my temporaries and remove uh, this? I uh, yes, and but also because it acts like a normal function, it doesn't have the stuff that just sits around in the environment anymore when you use my package to make your factory. So uh, it does, it takes care of that as well, basically. Um, yeah. All right, so uh, now we'll talk a little bit about why, like these are weird, complicated things. And honestly, most of the time you probably don't have a use for them. I've actually, like I love function factories and I think I've used them once in actual code. Um, but I'm working on ideas for how to actually use them more often. And actually, the, the one time I used it, it turned out I was reinventing a wheel that Gollum solved in a much simpler way. So uh, there is that. I love the idea of function factories, though. And I want to have a group to talk to about, hey, maybe this will work. Should we do Oh, is this a function factory? Um, they are a thing that is kind of overcomplicated at times. So sometimes you don't want to use it, but I'm going to show you a couple of reasons where you do want to use them. So the first one, and I coded this on purpose uh, in base R, not in my uh, function or factory way of doing things, partly because this actually doesn't currently work in the package um, unless Tyler has updated his latest PR because we have it, have it working and it's easier in the package, but it's not quite there. But so the idea is state, all right. <laughs> um, fact, function factories, because they have that environment that comes along for the ride, they can, uh, if you do some weird things, they can remember their state. Um, so the example that Hadley gives is a counter. I thought counters are boring. So I made a guessing game. Um, and what this is, is instead of being a too high, too low guessing game, it's a warmer, colder guessing game. So it take it looks at your previous, uh, how far away you were before and compares it to how far away you are now. Um, this code is really hard to see. We're gonna go back and forth because I couldn't fit everything on one screen, but we'll look at how it works in action and then we'll come back and see how it actually does what it does. So. I've got this guessing game. I make a new function out of the guessing game, guess, and I guess 50. And it says, oh, try again. So if I guess 75, it tells me I'm colder. So I go back down. And now when I do guess 50, it has a different return than when I did guess 50 before. It says, oh, warmer. I go down to 25, it says warmer. And if I go back up to 50, it says colder because it like it knows what it's doing. I did cheat a little. I gave it a specific value to make this slide because it will be different depending on every time you call it. The first thing it does is it chooses a number between one and a hundred. Um, and it says that the previous diff uh, is undefined basically that you don't have a previous one. And then what it does in the function itself, um, I, I have some error handling here that's not uh, super important, but it checks your thing. If you guessed right, it tells you you're right. Um, if you didn't guess right, it checks the uh, difference and compares. First, it checks, uh, did you not have a previous difference or is your previous difference exactly the same? It says, you says try again in that case. Um, if the new difference is, if you're closer now, it tells you you're warmer. And if you're colder or if you're further away, it tells you you're colder. And then it takes your um, your new diff and puts that into the environment of the function as the previous diff. And so the next time you call the function, new diff is now stored in that uh, in the function. Um, I thought that was cool. Like I've seen the normal guessing game of higher or lower a million times in programming books, but I, I hadn't seen a warmer, colder version because you can't most of the time. Like most functions don't have a memory of how they've been called before. Uh, again, not a lot of real uses for this, but I can imagine things like um, there are database things where you know you want to get the next set of data out of the database. So knowing 
it, it, like the function itself could remember the pointer. And actually that's a use that I just realized. Um, I've got the uh, Slack uh, package that I've worked with uh, Yanni CD on. Um, it has uh, uh, the, the functions in there for paging, uh, pagination of the results. It could just get the next page because it knows what the previous page was, or it could. It, you know, it could remember what your previous page was. And actually, I think I might implement it that way. Um, some more, I don't know, straightforward uses or, or uses that you've probably done with function factories, actually. Well, this one, probably not, but the next one you probably have. ggplot is full of arguments that are a number or a function. And the function can be different based on like your facet variable, for example, if it's a function factory. And so there are use cases where you are passing in some aesthetic into the factory and getting a different function, for example, for the binning function each time it's called. Um, and if you look at just any ggplot to help, like almost everything, you'll see that there's there are these um, or as a function and uh, you might not notice them until you do something like anything that uses scales. Like scales is a package of function factories. Almost everything in scales is a function factory and it returns a function, not a value. So like if you use number format, um, if we look at the code for this, they do, a, they actually have their own force, which is a massive, it, 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 it just is putting all of these into a list but it's doing that same thing of forcing evaluation of all the arguments that came in, and then it returns a function. Um, and then there's like comma format is just a call to number format, which returns a specified, uh, uh, a, a function factor, or it returns a function with some arguments preset. Um, all, almost all of the scales package is function factories. Um, another use case that Hadley talks about and uh, I wanted to definitely call out is expensive calculations. Now I'm pretending I didn't do an actual expensive calculation here, but the idea is, you know, you can have all this stuff that you do upfront in the function factory that maybe like I've got some models that I do that actually computing the model takes like an hour. Um, but then I wanna do a lot of stuff with that. And the idea is you could build that as a function factory such that when you call the function factory, it does that computation, maybe it takes an hour to do it, but now that computation is in the function that you can call. The example here is it's just doing a bootstrap on uh, empty cars based on a, a LM, that uh, the formula that you pass on it, or pass in, it does a bootstrap based on that. So every time you call this, it's a different bootstrap sample, but it doesn't have to recalculate the model itself. Um, there's a really cool example in the book that he does uh, an optimize on a function factory. And he even talks about that. It's not like you don't have to use a function factory to do it, but it, it does uh, save some compute, especially if it's a, a bigger um, set of data that you're using. And it conceptually separates the two tasks of the function itself and then the optimization of that function. Um, oh, and yeah, so if we look at this again, uh, it just has these values in the environment. So if we look at the environment, we can see that there's the, these, there are these values in like living inside of the function. Um, that's all I have. That was actually just over 20 minutes. Um, we can dive into some of the other code. I've got a whole bunch of other examples in the package, but first I just want to open it up to anything that people want to talk about with function factories. Or Maya probably has questions for us to go through. <laughs> I actually front loaded the questions this time in the <laughs> Slack channel. I feel pretty solid on this, but okay. I still am like trying to wrap my head around like non-contrived use cases so I can use your package. Yes. And like I say, I admit so far, every example I have is fairly contrived. Um, 
the bootstrap example one was actually you know, seems pretty useful one. So. Yeah, like I. I like this one a lot. This is one of his examples that really like spoke to me, makes sense. And like I say, you know, for this particular one, when you call boot model, it takes no time. But if you have like a really big data set or a really complica complicated model, it can take a lot of time. Um, I still don't entirely see why I wouldn't just like do this in an RMD and just do that part once, but um, there are examples. I'm sure, and I'm getting close to it. I'm I'm hunting for them, and I want to make them because it's. I think it is a really just interesting concept of programming, and not all languages allow it. Um, not all languages have first first class functions. Um, yeah, and so I do have the exact or the use case here where he RM. You know, he removes mod after calculating it. He does some cleanup. Or you can just use factory and then you don't actually have to do that because mod will be transient like a normal uh, variable within a function if you do it my way. <laughs> so can we do some live coding and factoryize this? Sure. Yes, that is a good example. Well, <laughs> yes, and I will do it. Oh, I didn't see the chat. Um, yeah, so, so Scott said, this, the idea of functions maintaining states was what I thought was the most interesting part of the chapter. But then at the end of 10.2.4, Headley basically says, it's better to use R6. <laughs> yes, so that's a buzzkill. Um, at least for me right now, function factories make more sense than R6. Um, maybe by the end of this whole endeavor, that won't be true anymore. Um, I, I still think that there are cases where you want like, it's hard to work with R6. Uh, taking someone else's R6 code and, like, rewriting it or, or improving it requires that you fully understand R6. Whereas taking someone else's function factory that maintains state, you can go, oh, oh, I see how you did that. And then you just tweak the function. So I like that aspect of it. Um, the other part is we're putting it into factory such that uh, the state when you print the function, it tells you what the current state of the function is, um, which is a thing that's definitely lacking in normal function factories. Um, yeah, I just know in, in previous coding, I've found myself, um, you know, well, in R, I've found myself getting to doing something like, why isn't this working? Oh, that's right, the function can't maintain the state. But, but then I learned, oh, it can. And then, but then I read, oh, but you shouldn't do that. You should do this instead. And I'm right. just going, no. So I, I actually think uh, with this, this PR that we have going right now, I think that's a big thing that the, the package is gonna handle because when you print the function, it tells you what the state is. And it, but it otherwise, it's just a function and you know how to edit it and you can mess around with it that way, um, which I still can't do with R6. When I see, when I use R6, I'm like, I have no idea what, like this is magic. Uh, I don't know what is happening. So I, I like the idea of doing a function factory, even when I get to where I understand R6, you know, the next person doesn't understand R6 and can't as easily build on what I've done. So um, I'm hopeful that we're gonna get there. So, all right, I am going to, uh, where is my, oh, let me make sure. <laughs> oh, I, Let me make sure I, before I use or load our studio that I don't have anything from work in here that I can't have showing, and I do not. All right. Um, hey, John, I had a question. Um, do, can you generate custom documentation for a function factory or the returned function from function factory? Um, not. Uh, I haven't done that yet. Um. One of the things I want to do in my package is uh, a lot of like RStudio add-in work it's to where it makes it not, it's only kind of a function factory, like internally it'll use a function factory, but then it just returns a function that is purely a function that you could use in your package and whatnot. Um, but I haven't fully implemented that stuff yet. You can't, well, so actually, no, um, if we, you know, like, uh, let's say I'm in a package and I did, uh, 
you know, new fawn is, oops, gets build factory um, and pass it all the arguments, blah, blah, blah. I, I could like document that. Um, there's a whole uh, blog post, or not blog post, but a thread on GitHub that uh, it's between, I think, Jenny Bryan and Hadley about build time dependencies and how dangerous they are for packages. But that's actually a thing that I am currently working on solving with function or with factory so that you could have this thing. So actually, I'm sorry, this is actually documentation for the factory, not documentation for the manufactured function under the factory. But then you could say newer fun gets new, oops, new fun, blah, blah, blah. And you could document that. Um, so in theory, you could. Now I had to type because uh, if I try to get, try to use the hotkey in our studio, it's like, what? No, there's no function there. You can't, you can't document that, but it will let you do it. Um, it just acts like it won't let you do it. Um, so go ahead. I was just gonna say, I, I've actually, I've done this before and I was gonna ask the same question of, you know, I had a function factory and I explicitly use it to define functions that are then exported in the package. Um, but, you know, you can, you can provide sort of standard uh, Roxygen uh, markdown to produce a documentation, but it seems a little weird that I don't actually have the function explicitly right. in the code. It's the factory code that produced the function. Yeah. Um, um, you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're doing it like uh, internally to a package, like if you define the function factory in the package and then use it in the package, that's no problem. The big warning is about if you have a dependency on another package um, at build time of the package instead of at runtime, um, it works. Like when you install a package, you tend to install the, the things that it depends on or that it imports but technically you don't have to do that. And so the actual act of installing the package could crash instead of the act of using the package crashing. Um, and there are other things, but I, those are uh, those specific issues I plan to work around um, because that's kind of my whole thing with this package is working around the weird things. All right, so we want to take, uh, oops. I, I actually already have this code, but I want to write it from scratch um, on purpose. So let's do this, this uh, the model. And I'm going to open up the book to page, uh, where are you? To page 264 or section 1042 um, so that I have the code handy. Oops. So we've got this boot model and I'm going to start by writing it as basically exactly as it is in the book. So it's a factory. Um, it takes, oh, actually, I am going to make a slight change from the book. Hadley has a weird habit, um, which actually I'm going to allow a little bit, but he uses like this. Uh, I don't like doing this where my variable is the function that I'm calling to create the variable. Like, yeah, it works, it's fine, but it breaks my brain a little bit that I have two different objects named fitted now. I don't like that. So I, I did like fitted var or fitted, I guess fitted vars. Um, and, and same with residuals. It doesn't really matter, but I still, um, <laughs> part of the reason for that is when I was first writing this package, um, not fitted, resid. Uh, I got burnt by Hadley's examples. I'll used exp instead of exponent. And I thought something was working, but it actually was only working because it was detecting that that was also the name of a function and being like, oh, that's fine. And like, it was weird, crazy code that shouldn't have worked anyway, but I didn't, you know, it was hard to detect. And so now I'm kind of obsessively, I say mostly because 
I use df all the time, and df is actually a function. Um, but it's a function that I never use, so I guess I, I'm okay with that. All right, so uh, we're using that to build this function that returns fitted vars uh, plus sample resid bar, oops, resid vars. And yes, so now if we say boot empty cars is boot model empty cars mpeg and wait, oops. And then we do oops, head boot empty cars. And if we call it again, it's a different result. Okay. Before we go on, we don't have to force anything here because we're doing all the work in there. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, I'm actually a little. I th oh, oh, because technically, technically you could have a fitted vars yeah, because you're creating it there. So we are using DF and formula. And so the DF and formula get evaluated and all these other variables are, they can't get masked by things in the global environment because they're local to the factory. Um, so yes, because we're using them, we don't have to force. All right, so let's do model two. And it's going to be a build factory. Um, so the first thing I'm going to give it is um, the function. So that part's easy. That's just this. Oops. And uh, one thing to be careful of, especially like, you know, because we're recording this, if you're watching this later, I am about to change the name of every argument in build factory because it's super dangerous. Like this is called fun. Uh, this, this argument is fun, but you could have a, an argument called fun in your own function and they would collide and that would be bad. And so uh, by the time you're watching this, it'll probably be that is the actual name of the argument because no one's gonna use that in their own function. Um, likewise, I've got, I started, I thought I had it. It's like oh, I, internal variables, but I'm gonna put factory on the front of all of these. So factory internal variables is a list and it is um, a named list of these things that I'm making and I'm just gonna copy and paste. And it's mod is an LM of that and uh, fitted vars, resid vars. Um, I think that's, oh, and then I have to tell it, oh no, there are no arguments to my function. So I think, a, oh, commas, yes, because I copied, pasted. And, oh, comma there. All right, there we go. And in theory, actually, I can just do this. I'm going to put in all the twos and then call it and see if I got it right. Uh, um, oh, no, this does have arg arguments. What am I doing? This one, uh, the, sorry, yes, the factory itself has arguments of DF and formula, duh. There we go. And so now it works. Um, I swear it's easier, that, it is actually easier to do. I just missed a step because I was talking, but yes, you, you have to tell it still, like I said, I'm trying, to, I'm fighting back and forth with myself of whether, I need you to tell me the arguments or I can figure them out myself. Um, but yeah, you just have to pass in dots of what the arguments are. Um, you, so, go ahead. I was gonna say, I don't know if you're gonna get there, can you print the functions? Oh yes. So uh, the original one is the mystery where it's got fitted vars and resid vars and we don't know what they are. And actually that's a little hard to see, but the uh, factory, build factory produced one actually puts those numbers in the function. Um, it's a little hard to read in this particular case, but if you look at it, it's just, it's got those numbers that are materialized in the function. So you, you can see them, you don't have to be confused by it. You don't have to get lost in what did it actually do. It's there. Uh, 
Um, do we want to look in look at how that works? It's a little so uh, technically this code is wrong. It's lying because well, it's uh, it has already been improved. I don't have the latest pull request pulled down, um, but it's basically the same thing. So what we do. This is used, like I say, it's using all the stuff from Arlang that we're going to talk about in about nine chapters. Um, and what this came from actually is if you jump ahead into chapter, I think it's chapter 19, there is, uh, where are you? There's a section on this function that's in Arlang called new fun. Um, I don't have it handy but he talks about hey this is another way that you could do function factories and technically it makes cleaner functions but you know it's way more confusing to code this way i was like well but what if it wasn't more confusing to code this way what if we hid all the confusion so all right so the first thing i gotta capture the dots that you're passing in and i've got to get those names um this is because you're passing in you know something like df and I have to make sure that I don't evaluate df anywhere within my function because df doesn't actually exist. Uh, well, df exists because it's a function, but not the version of df that you want to exist. Um, likewise, uh, so then I take those arguments and we go through some crazy Arlang. Um, oh, actually, I got to jump out to going to jump to a different branch because this fails right now. So I don't want to walk through the code that doesn't actually work. Um, so let's do that. Come on, that should have changed. No, oh, well, actually I'll just go and pull. You swear that it works now, right? Uh, it passed all the tests last time I ran it. Okay. And actually, before I run that, I need to go back to master. All right. I mean, actually, I think it did work. It was just the, the test itself had gotten muddled. OK. I will trust that it does. Uh, no, I don't want to save my version. I want to revert. All right. Before I walk through, I'm going to make sure that the current version of the code actually passes tests. Let's, uh... There we go. All right. So we are all good. Um, so all right, now we look at it. And it, it is that same code. It is taking these dots and it goes through and uh, it does some cleaning. It's basically what we're doing here. I don't know. I don't really want to dig too deep into the Arlang, partly because uh, I can never remember exactly what each piece of the Arlang is doing yet. I don't have it fully internalized, but we're going through and um, <laughs> making sure that the dots aren't broken, the stuff that you passed in. And, and some, like you can actually pass uh, default values. And so it's got to do special things if you did give it a default value. Um, otherwise, you know, when we do that call, uh, we're just passing in like DF, which technically like the, the way I originally wrote this package, that's what you had to pass in, which is more technically correct, but crazy. And no one should be required to do that. Um, so DF and formula are your dots here. Yes. And they are okay. the arguments of the factory. And so they are the names of the arguments. They're not the right-hand side, the, the values of the arguments. Um, and so it, because I just didn't want people to have to put, you know, have to do this construction. Um, DF equals the same as DF null equals null? No, it isn't. It is, uh -huh. so uh, let's do, um, do we even see there's so I think a list is the only base function where you can have just the left hand side. Um, no, and that's what uh, you're doing here. 
So, uh, another example. I mean, there are a few examples. Switch is oh, an example. Okay, okay. Yeah. But yeah, um, just it's weird, and I it looks weird to me, so I didn't want to do that. So I I take it, and so then if we look at the code, like one of the things we're doing here is seeing um, that it is empty, that it's it doesn't have a name. Um, so yeah, that's the names dot equals nothing. Uh, then we make it a missing argument. We do all these different, all these things along the path. Um, and then we actually do uh, set it up to be evaluated. Um, oh, and actually that's where we evaluate the right-hand side if you give it to us, but not the left-hand side. And then we flatten it, set the names. Um, <laughs> so, all right, so that's the arguments. And that is, again, anything that you're passing in as dots, that's anything, you know, that's DF, that's formula, that could be, you know, I could give it another argument. And if we look at it, um, now boot model two is a, uh, is a function that takes these three arguments. Um, or if I go back to where it was before, boot model two just has the two arguments. Um, and I could also say, uh, for example, this is a weird case. I could give it this default argument. I think that worked. Yeah. Um, so actually, and so now that will, you know, this would work and it would do the same thing as it had done before. Um, so that's why there's all the crazy R lang is to let you do these things like that. Uh, and then the next piece, this is one that I added, but I think just yesterday. Um, I do not like this code cur currently, and I cannot wait to read these later chapters and fix this code because it is awful and it cannot t t just possibly be right. What this is, I've got this internal variables list. And this is where I wanted you to be able to pass in just things that should be computed at the beginning of your factory. Um, and I want you wanted a way for you to pass it in logically. And so you're passing in in a list. And again, I can't actually evaluate this because DF doesn't exist in, in the factory. It only exists in the call to the factory. And so I have to protect that with the NX per of that list, but I couldn't find a way to take that list and protect it and then split the list back apart because anytime I wanted to splice the list, it would also unquote the list. And I don't want to unquote the list. I only want to break it off, break it back apart into dots. So I had to hack. Um, and so if if there is this to do, if you, if you passed it in any internal variables, I turned that into a character, make sure that the word at the beginning of it is list like it should be. And I stop if I'm not. And then I take that character and I, or, or that, sorry, not that it's no longer a character. I just take that expression and get rid of that first thing that is just telling me that it's a list. And now what I have left is a list of expressions, uh, quoted expressions that I can then do crazy things with. This is not the right, there's gotta be a better way to do this. Somewhere in our lang, there's a way to do this. I couldn't find it, so I hacked it. And uh, one thing to know is pretty much everything in our lang, if it's something you call inside of the function, it has en at the start. And if you wanna do the equivalent thing outside of the function, you just take off the en. So I can show you what I mean here by uh, saying that my to do, gets Arlang expert that. And if we look at to do, just look at it, it looks like it's just that call, which is weird, that you can then subset that call. And for example, it's got list as the first element of that subset. Technically here, I could probably, instead of saying as character, I could say that it's a, the symbol list instead of the character list. Um, Either there's an as either an as character or an as symbol somewhere. Uh, but yeah, so now so so we have this to do. It looks like this, but I say, oh, get rid of that. Oops, 
get rid of that first list element. And now to do is a list of my quoted variables. Um, again, like I say, there's got to be a better way to do it, but everything I tried evaluated those and evaluating is bad for these. We can't evaluate them because that breaks everything. Um, that Would it was... be a pain for homework to make a little reprex of what you're doing here? Because I have an idea that probably won't work, but it'd be fun to <laughs> play with. Um, yeah, I can do just what I just did, starting from the expert. Um, and then like this code, try to reproduce the result without such an ugly, ugly hack. So I welcome that. And if you want to PR, uh, the, the package, as long as, I don't know, one of these nights I'm going to go to bed and wake up in the middle of the night and, oh, I forgot to quo or something. I don't What's, know. What does um, STR, like structure of to do look like? Um, <laughs> I see you're just calling the print method on it. Right. <laughs> no, it's a oh. dotted pair list. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why I say I, I look forward to studying those chapters 18 through 20 or so on all the crazy Arlang stuff because I kind of get it right now, but I don't know what a dotted pair list is. Yeah, I'm really excited to not just brute force use all the different like things that sound like the first element to know. Yeah, all right, so let's do, let's go back to that. <laughs> What the hell? <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, wow. Um. <laughs> Type out. Just, just continuing to experiment here. Uh, uh, oh. Um. What? No, it's type. Yeah. Type. Ooh, there's no underscore. Yeah. Type of. That was weird. It auto-corrected to a thing that doesn't exist. But it's a it's a language object. And then if we do uh, to do one is null, and then do type of to do, it's a pair list. Because obviously, setting one object from a list to null totally changes what it is. That's normal. Um, <laughs> that's um, and it's funny that I keep forgetting to delete this. That is a remnant of a future. Uh, piece of functionality that I keep forgetting to delete out of each PR. So we won't look at that, that piece yet. All right. And then the other piece is we've got the, uh, uh, the, the, the function that we're passing in. And so if we go way back up here, um, function, or actually over here, this one, actually, we don't have to do that much crazy to make it workable. That's the function that we're passing in. It's already a function. We don't have to quote it because it doesn't evaluate until we actually call it. So that's all good. And what we do here is um, what I want to do is I want to go through dot names, which is the names of the dots. So it's FN and, uh, or not FN, uh, DF and uh, formula or formula. Yeah, DF and formula. And Anywhere that those appear in the function, so, you know, in fun, uh, <laughs> sorry, and not just DF and formula, but also the derived internal variables, so fitted vars, resid vars, anytime they appear, I want to replace them with uh, the, oops, sorry, we're up here, the actual call or the, uh, uh, what is their new word, the diffusion of those variables that the actual value of those variables has to get replaced when you create the, the manufactured function, but not before you create the manufactured function. So if we do, um, let's do, let me get um, dots is Arlang uh, quos of df and formula and then to do we already have so now yep and we can do args and we can we already did that and we added 
the to do names onto dot names. And so now what we're doing is we are going through um, those dots and replacing. So if we look at dot names, it is just the names of all the things. We're looking for those in our function and replacing them. And this is another function that's actually in this package. Um, why are you not loading? There we go. Um, which is kind of a like a regex replacement ish for functions. Um, this was another just a little bit of craziness that I went through, and it's uh, it's uh, uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for? It calls itself. It is a um, a certain type of function where it's a recursive recursive function. Thank you. Um, yeah, so it's a recursive function that will go through and break up, break down the function that you pass into it and find the little pieces that are formula. And it looks for that word formula and replaces it with our evaluated thing. This is where um, I think technically the way it's set up right now, it won't replace like the word or the resid if we had had a variable named resid, I think we fixed that, but it's dangerous because I don't want to do that. I don't want to risk that. So I separate them out, um, but we'll probably have some bug reports that I have to deal with and I'll deal with that eventually. But anyway, it goes through and, and it does all that replacement. So that's uh, that's where we are here. And now if we look at fun after that runs, that's what fun is now. So the thing we passed in has the, the bang bangs in it. Um, when we get to the bang bang chapters, wrapping it in ticks is not normal. That wouldn't be a thing that you would normally do when you call it, but it works. And so close enough to normal. Um, Tyler has done some editing on it, but the general concept here, I had an ugly, ugly eval parse thing originally when I first wrote this package and I tweeted about, uh, I said, I was like, you know, Jim Hester says never ever do this, but I couldn't find a better way to solve it. Um, is this a case where it makes sense? And he PR'd, he's like, no, this is how you should do it. So I like him a lot. He's a really nice guy. And he knows how to code these crazy R lang things without having to just do trial and error like I do. So, um, so then, all right. So then we make this child function, which uses this new function uh, from R lang. And new function is really the meat of everything that we're getting into here. New function is how to create a function it's like a function factory maker, but it's really confusing to use. And so the, this whole package is a wrapper around new function to make it less confusing to use. Um, and it takes the formals of, of fun as the arguments, and it takes the that body that we created, um, evaluated as the body, and it, now importantly, it uses the caller environment for the environment of the function, ex unless, and I guess this isn't in this version right here right now, but uh, it, it, we're coming or we're making a version that can remember state because like we can't write the guessing game in fa in uh, factory right now. But sometimes you might want to remember state. And so we're making a version where it will set set up its own environment um, to remember state within. Uh, let's see if we want to pass the dots, it does some extra code that I don't want to dig into too much, but that's some extra fun. And then um, it does, it'll take those internal things. And this was one that confused me. So we've got this to do and uh, it computes mod and then it uses mod for fitted vars and for resid vars. And at first I didn't have these revs. And so it was reducing and adding those assignments to the start of the function, which means that first it added this to the start of the function, and then in front of that, it added this, and then in front of that, it added this, which doesn't work because we need mod to be the first thing in the function. And so that was all, that's just why these are reversed is because it needs the first one to be first. Um, so it does all that again, this is a function I wrote, that doesn't want to load, but it is uh, another recursive function that is going to go through and find uh, 
find the spot in the function where you told it to insert and it inserts code at that point in the function. All right, and then finally, we make a new function of a new function because it's a function factory, uh, which takes that child fun fun and is it's all wrapped inside of there. So yeah, that's my crazy package. And so if I don't think we did look at, um, oops, boot model two has that our lang new function. It has bang bang and it has um, you know an environment that it sets. So it is it is more confusing to read, and that is the sacrifice that my the result of factory is the factory is a little hard to understand, but the result of the factory makes a lot more sense. And actually, if we go to, um, you know, let's go way back to the uh, the basics, the, the one that all this kind of is based on. Um, you know, if we do the power one, the basic way, and then we make square one, it's totally opaque what square one does because exponent is invisible. Whereas if we go way down and we make it using factory, um, and whatever, it works like normal and it just is a function. Like there's nothing crazy about the resulting function. So yeah, that's my crazy package. Hopefully in chapter 19, we'll understand how this package works. I admit that there are parts of it that I only kind of understand how it works and I wrote it. <laughs> so there is that. Tyler wrote a lot of it, really. He refactored uh, a big chunk of code. And I thank you for that quite a bit. I think it'd be awesome to revisit this ch after chapter 19, if I you'd be willing. Absolutely agree. Um, I think that would be fun. I think when we get to that chapter, there's a good chance that I'm going to refactor a lot of this package. So we'll see how that goes. Um, we will have the stateful functions in there. And like I said, I, I think a killer uh, thing about it is we're making a print method for stateful function so that when you make a stateful function it and you print it, it will tell you the current values. Now that would ruin the guessing game, so don't print the guess uh, function, but for normal uses, it would re let you see what it thinks right now. So coming soon. <laughs> Anything else? Any other questions? If you only like kind of understand this, I don't know how I would describe my own level of understanding. I'd probably <laughs> like, I mean, I do I sort of understand this, but <laughs> yeah, well, and I mean, yeah, I, I most like I, I mostly understand what it's doing, but it's more like I have to walk through some of it. Like, I'll, when we do the parsing of the arguments, at the time that I was writing any individual part of that, it totally made sense. Uh, when we do this, but I can't tell you looking at the code without like really diving in and walking through what is each of these modify ifs really doing. But I know it's things like dealing with, uh, it actually, I think still accepts if you do put in the equals, like it just deals with that, I think. Yeah. Um, that's one of the ifs. Yeah, it's basically like trying to handle all the different ways you could possibly define the formal arguments. Right, and so, and like technically that is fine, and then we could just call it without any arguments. Um, and it still works. So there's, that's one of the ifs, or the modify ifs in there. Um, and now actually we see, that's actually a funny thing. It doesn't put empty cars into the default, it puts the definition of empty cars, but then we could say again, quote it. This is another crazy part of it. Oops, but then, um, sorry, that was boot model two, that now the default is empty cars, not the value of empty cars. All these, like all these cases are what is in there. And I'm sure Tyler actually has a better understanding of it right now because he just rewrote this uh, from a much longer, messier version into the nice, beautiful uh, per code. 
So yes, definitely chapter 19. We're gonna we're gonna have to look at this again. Oh, geez, and chat is full and I didn't see it happening. Is there anything that I should uh, address? Oh, we're just making fun of your setup. <laughs> My beautiful, beautiful setup. I told you that I was gonna trigger you, Tan. <laughs> No, but, uh, having like the default setup well you have the default setup except the panes that's actually really, really helpful for like when you teach people or just like i guess general like, yeah i actually things. almost just set it all back so that people wouldn't be distracted and i actually did intend to make it larger because we want to be able to go through the code but i didn't <laughs> And yeah, I like, I don't know. I like this layout. I like, uh, this is all like my files and my evil, evil environment. I did learn through this club that sometimes when I'm working on this package, as I did here, I have to turn off oops, the uh, refresh because I had to like, you know, I lost track of what environment was actually being used and the environment pane makes that more difficult sometimes. Um, what I can't get over is console being a different width than your source. <laughs> How is that possible? Like well, it, it, it gets even worse because I moved this window. I have a, um, I have a monitor that is portrait mode. And so then it's totally different because then I need the, uh, this part to be wider relatively. Um, which actually, you know, might explain something to Tyler that I have a portrait mode monitor and thus I have this function that has grown into this beast <laughs> <laughs> that we're going to split apart. That's the next uh, refactoring is I want to split this function down into smaller functions because it has gotten pretty intense. Um, but yeah, the next version is going to know about or is going to be able to know about state. Uh, and then I'm going to probably try to go back to uh, in our studio add in that is still a goal I have where you would be able to take um, like, you know, say for example, do that, click and add in, and then it would turn it into the factory version of that function. Or you um, mean like type control alt X? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> uh, and it would just make the better version, but um, I'm not there yet. I did, I played around with that right after I wrote the package, but it didn't quite work. And then I had all these other things I kept working on with it and never went back to that. So we'll see. That is actually something I don't think it's anywhere in an advanced R and I don't think it's in our packages even, but uh, at, our studio add-ins are not that hard to make and they're awesome. Um, so sometime we'll have to do a little side thing talking about how those work because uh, they're cool. And their tan would love them because they're all shiny based. So. It might be a good topic for the shiny book discussion. Yeah, um, it maybe it'll be in there. I don't know. I haven't checked that book um, if it's in the table of contents, but it's good stuff. Anything else? That's more than all I have. <laughs> I'm still trying to wrap my head, Sarth is a stupid question, around like why this package or how this package removes the need to RM things. Are you like taking, a by using the factory, it's like kind of not that factory environment any, anymore. Now it's just X squared. Yes. So because, and really it's because of this argument right here that it's saying create this function in, not in the execution environment, but instead create the function in the caller environment. And I made that possible by substituting in all the values instead of just saving the values. Okay, that makes uh, sense. Yep. It's, ba it's building the language that defines the function itself. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that is actually some, another piece that I still want to fix is um, like, let's look at uh, if you do attributes LM. Oh, what? 
Because <laughs> it has a sword. Threat, Nailed right? it. What? Um. What? Why is my brain broken? Normal functions have source refs, and maybe it's maybe you have to use yeah. Um, no, that's I, I'm sorry. I, well, I don't remember the the call to use anymore. But normal. So the important thing is, let's say I did this uh, function. Uh, this is a comment. That comment actually isn't in the body of the function. It's in the source ref of the function. So if we look up here, there is no comment where I put it. And that's a thing I want to fix. So I want to actually maintain the source ref in addition to the function. But that would mean that I'm going to have to do character replacement through the function and like symbol replacement through the function. And so maybe I won't ever do that. We'll see. <laughs> But yeah, so right now, if you pass comments in, they, they get eaten by, by Build Factory. They go away. Yeah, it gets, it gets a lot hairier when you want to start messing with the comments and everything. Yeah, um, and it's because, like, if we look at, you know, fun, um, if we print fun, it's got that comment in it. But if you do body fun, it doesn't. And we use body fun to rebuild the functions which sounded kind of dirty. So, all right. Um, with that, I think I need to take off. So uh, if there are any questions, definitely bring them up in the channel. Um, and we will keep going there. I'm sure Tyler and I will keep talking about weird fixes that we're doing in the package. And feel free to chime in in any of those conversations. Um, or and, and I will try to, I'll, I'll put that um, reprex up for the to do and see if anyone can figure out how to do it without a hack. Uh, Cause I do not like my hack. Sweet. This was awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I was very happy to do it. And I was very happy to have a reason to work on this package again, because again, I don't have an actual use for it, but I love the idea of it so much that I want to work on it more. So, all right. See ya. <laughs>